Okay, so today um, we're on chapter nine, the Enlightenment. There's a, I selectively chose things to cover. At the end, I'll give, hopefully I'll give you all a chance to discuss something that you found in there that I didn't cover. I'll give you, so I'm gonna leave that at the end. If I go through something, you say, wait a minute, you skipped that part. You get your shot at the end um, if, it, if it's interesting to you. So, <clears throat> how do I? My screen is, oops. So by the end of the 16th century, the, uh, the West was beginning to advance technologically. This had a, a huge development. This development had a huge change uh, effect on the society and the Western perception of the role and nature of God. And this led to special, this process led to the special, special, specialization where uh, experience was, expertise was required in a particular field. And as these specialists emerged, they interacted with other specialists and it led to a process of continual development, which this was, this continual development was taken as a sign of progress. And Armstrong says, the, his, the study of history was dominated by a new myth, that of progress. So what does she mean by that? The myth of progress. Anybody have any thoughts on why she would call this the new myth? I think we went through a time, they went through a time period of conservatism, preserving the old as being of high value. And then with uh, the age of enlightenment, it was a matter that um, there should be development, there should be progress, uh, everything should uh, change. Change was more acceptable and change was actually desirable. Okay. And we're still caught between those two extremes today. Okay, I guess I'm kind of probably hung up on the word myth a little bit. I understand myth is not um, necessarily mean it's true or false, but I don't think of, I guess I don't think of progress as being a myth in a way. It's just, it just is to me. You, you bought into the myth. Okay, I bought into the myth. Okay. Um, previous to the age of enlightenment, you can keep abreast, and this is kind of like the typical Renaissance man, you can keep abreast of all the things that were going on, the uh, things that were being learned, but with all the advances that were being made now, that was became impossible. Nobody could keep abreast of everything that was being uh, learned on all these different fronts. Um, so you became, so that's, I mean, that's why they became specialists. You just couldn't keep in, in touch with everything and know what all was happening. Um, there just wasn't enough time to do that. So you, specialization was, I think, was why that happened. There just, it's impossible to keep up. So with this, and as they advanced technologically, they were able to start controlling things that before had been uh, left in, you know, nature was in charge instead of humans, which led them to believe that they could, uh, by their own efforts, achieve enlightenment. Um, one book I was reading said the enlightenment was about thinking for yourself rather than letting others think for you. But this enlightenment, there was, um, was the scientific age was based on observation, experiment, um, you've heard of the scientific method. I think that was Francis Bacon developed that. But the, the people that were accepting this new approach, this using observation experiment, this scientific method, they felt they could apply this to their uh, traditional Christian beliefs and the, that they needed to take a look at these traditional explanations, Christian explanations of reality and 
maybe give them a little update. At this time, I think we've talked about this before, but most scientists and philosophers, they still believe that God existed. But there were some that were starting to say, well, maybe you can't take that for granted. One of those uh, first ones to think that was uh, Pascal. And he was convinced there was no way that uh, you could prove the existence of God. And so Armstrong calls him the first modern because he questioned the existence of God and thought it was a said it was a matter of belief or a matter of personal choice. And this is where we come up with this um, what is known as Pascal's wager. He said that faith was a gamble. It wasn't a rational decision. Based on common sense, it was impossible to prove God existed. Uh, also equally impossible to prove he didn't exist. So here's what he said in, uh, I copied out of her book. We are incapable of knowing either what God is or whether uh, God, um, or whether he is. Reason cannot decide this question. Infinite chaos separates us. At the far end of this distant, infinite distance, a coin is being spun, which comes, which will come up heads or tails. How will you wager? So, um, but he didn't think this. You make this wager, but he thought that there really was a. Uh, you should wager one way rather than just the flip of the coin willy-nilly choose one or the other. He's, he thought if you believed it, choose, you chose to believe in God, that um, that was the win-win because if you live this, and this was deciding how to live your life, if you decide to live your life believing in God, then you would try to live a virtuous life. And then at the end of your life, after you had died, you would go to this reward in heaven, whereas if you chose to live, um, I don't know what kind of life you call it, but a life of sensuous life, enjoying the pleasures of the world while you're on this earth, then at the end, you're waging, you know, you might end up in hell for eternity. So you have this short time where you uh, enjoy life, but then in the long run, you're going to be in some place that's not so pleasurable versus the other way is maybe a short time of sacrificing maybe some things that you might enjoy. But in the long run, that's the way I, way I understood his uh, wager. Does anybody think of it any differently? I, I didn't understand it I, <clears throat> because I think his position, you have to presuppose the existence of God. If you say that the risk is finite, but the gain is infinite, what if the gain is potentially equally not infinite? You know, he's, 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 he's already drawn the conclusion that he believes in God, and then he makes this wager, and he's saying, I'm going to win either way, so he's, all he's doing is hedging his bets. Does that make sense? I, I, don't, I don't follow his logic at all. I didn't understand this. I, I agree with you, Paul, but the argument here would be that uh, if he is right that God exists and he gets all these uh, uh, <clears throat> incentives and in that to do it, and if God doesn't exist, well, what has he lost? Well, that's the way I see it, but that's not the way I hear him saying it. That's, that's where I'm a little bit lost with this, because if he yeah, says the gain is infinite, he's already drawn that conclusion. That, yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm just okay. I think he was a poker player. He was doing a it's called a semi bluff in poker, where you make the big bet and hope everybody else folds and you hope that you are going to win. So, well, maybe, maybe he played, played poker. 
Well, it was a wager. Um, I don't know. I guess I didn't have a problem with his wager. It seemed like he was saying, well, say you, say you live 60 years a virtuous life and God doesn't exist. Well, that whole life wasn't entirely wasted, I guess you'd say. Whereas if you spent the 60 years doing exactly what you want to do, no thought about it, and God didn't exist, well, okay, maybe you had a little more enjoyment than the other way, but if God does exist, then you, there's a, eternity is a lot longer than the, your lifespan, so that's, maybe we're saying the same thing, Paul, I don't know. <clears throat> well, Pascal had had a, um, he had had a religious experience himself. Uh, I think he was always torn between his religious experience and this scientific um, side of himself. But he said that um, faith is not an intellectual certainty. It's a leap, a leap into the dark. And the experience brings more enlightenment. I think, and maybe that's a reference to his own experience where he, he thought he had, a, he had this religious, it lasted quite a while actually, I think. It, I think she said so, it. several hours. Yeah, I was thinking it's a couple hours. So it, didn't it take place at night? I, I wondered if he was having a dream or something. I didn't. I, I didn't really specify what you know the nature of his experience was too much. I didn't think. No, it didn't really specify, but I did. I, it did happen at night. I thought it lasted like from. I was going to say ten thirty till. Yeah, half past 10 until about half past half after midnight. Um, yeah. And the only thing it said was that he realized that his faith was very academic. So they didn't really go into the details. For having something last two hours, I, you'd think you'd, you'd have a few more details. But anyway. To me, this is just kind of... I, I don't see that it's any different, his experience, than a lot of the previous people we've talked about yeah. um, who came to the conclusion that you can't rationalize God, you have to experience God for it, for God to be real to you. And that's kind of what he found out, I think. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, so here's the guy that has a different viewpoint. Uh, from Pascal, <clears throat> that's Descartes. He said, intellectually, you could know for certain that God exists. And he was, <clears throat> this is the part I thought was, he could be known more easily and certainly than any other thing in existence. And I'm, I have a little problem with that part that he's the easiest thing to know, but that's what he thought. Um, and then this next part, I, uh, he said that evidence of God was, you found it in human consciousness. We can't be certain of anything in the external world, but we can be certain of our own inner experience. You know, and then he came up with the famous phrase, I think, therefore I am. <clears throat> so my thought was, well, how certain are you of your own inner experience? I mean, I have, I've had some inner experiences that later didn't prove out to be right. Um, <clears throat> So I, I don't think I would be that certain about some things like he was. I mean, how, how's, it, how's that work for everybody else? Have you ever had an experience, Eloise, that later you doubted that that was a valid experience? I don't think of any right off, but I had experiences that I knew were for certain. Okay. I felt for certain. So you might agree with Descartes then that you could trust your inner experiences. You felt like you could trust those. So he, he's saying that you can, you can intellectually prove the certainty that God exists. Um, so in science, if you can conduct an experiment and demonstrate the presence of something, you know, the presence of oxygen or the presence of water or whatever it might be. Um, that's a little bit higher up on the scale of knowing or the, the pyramid of, um, of proof, if you will. Whereas to me, 
you know, doing these intellectual experiments in one's mind is, is no different than somebody's personal opinion, which is at the very bottom of the pyramid. That's the lowest form of, of gaining knowledge or gaining information about the universe. So I'm not sold on, <clears throat> on his argument either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I took logic in college and, and, you know, many times those logical arguments you know, if A exists and B exists, then A and B both exist, that kind of stuff. I mean, there's always a point at which those break down. Okay. That's, that's different than actually, um, you know, doing any experiment, you know, flying a kite with a silk string on it and, and discovering electricity. That's a little bit more tangible to me. Yeah. Well, this, this next sentence I've got here, according to Cart, our experience of doubt therefore tells us that a supreme and perfect being God must exist. I, I don't think I really grasp what, how he's, the fact that you can doubt something, therefore it must exist. I'm still trying to understand that. Can anybody explain that better than? It doesn't make too much sense. Okay. Then I say that again. <clears throat> the experience of doubt, therefore, tells us that a supreme, that you can have an experience of doubt, tells you that there must be a God. Anybody else have a insight here that I don't have? As I say, well, it doesn't make any you, sense. It, it, I mean, it doesn't make sense because if you everything you doubt exists, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Well, I'm not a philosopher, so. I, yeah, that's that's a little strange. You know, he says, I think, therefore, I am. But. He, you know, then he says, I doubt, therefore God is. I, that's, that's a strange argument to me, too. <laughs> okay. I guess I'm just not a philosopher. Me neither. <laughs> well, Isaac Newton, I, I guess I could understand his logical a little better. Um, because he used mechanics, and this is... Uh, mechanics of the universe, I guess you'd say, to explain the, he used mechanics to explain the physical universe, and he considered God to be a, a part of that system. He called God the divine mechanic. That was his terminology. And God was basically just part of the natural system. Um, so that convinced him of God's existence. And the way he thought about it was uh, these laws of motion, gravity, and other things, they were so perfectly conceived and contrived to create this universe. There must have been some supremely intelligent mechanic that thought it all up. So that was, he was seeing in, in the universe, seeing God. But before, for this to occur or, or for this universe to exist, this mechanic had to have uh, the uh, capability, the power to control these bodies in motion. And so he thought that dominion, this power to control the universe was the force that set the heavens, heavenly bodies in motion. So that was, uh, that was his conception of, of God. This seems a, I can follow this because he's looking, you know, Deriving some of the laws of motion that, and, and things that you can measure, I can kind of see that. To me, that makes, I, have, I can accept that easier than, than Descartes' logic. I don't know if that worked for any, if that was easier for anybody else, but it was for me. Well, Carl Sagan used to describe, you know, belief in God as, as sort of being on a spectrum. And on one end, you have... Um, you know, the God who is personal and, and communicates with you and you communicate back with that God. And then on the other end is someone who accepts that what we call as God is the sum total of all the laws of the universe. And I, to me, that's the same as, as what Sagan is saying. Is that kind of what so, you're getting out of it, Dennis? Yeah, and there's another guy that kind of says that same thing but later on we'll, we'll get they're saying Sagan and Newton agree? Just on this point. 
I'm not sure that Sagan agreed. I'm not sure that Sagan personally uh, accepted that the laws of the universe were were what God was. I'm, I don't know if Sagan was an atheist or, or an agnostic or exactly what his religious perspective was. I don't think he was religious. That part I think is true. Jeremy, this, is, this is Jane. Um, I always thought that science is trying to catch up to God because it's just taken us so long to figure out things like like what like the human body and and how it works you know i mean there's so much that we don't know that there must be some kind of i, I like the word mechanic <laughs> like newton said somebody who created this that we're trying to figure out how he did it i like that concept <laughs> As we figure out more things, Look, uh, Jeremy, were you going to say something? Well, the main problem is uh, this is all fine and good, but I mean, then you have to sort of say, well, where did God come from? Well, there's always, there's always that question of where, that you can't answer, I think, about where God came from. Um, right. I mean, so, so it's all kind of a circular argument one way or another. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, so before you move on, I, okay. I keep in the back of my head. I keep wondering if we are, if our perspective has been so biased by science uh -huh. that we can't think that in fact there can be internal experiences that are revelatory. Okay, you know, is is the view of God by a mystic who ponders the nature of things any less any less or more valid than the scientist who tries to explain it by the movement of the stars and the, the order of the universe i mean sometimes we we poo poo some of this stuff i wonder if we are so biased by our scientific age that uh -huh. we don't understand that there are other ways to approach god just a just a thought well some of this is very <laughs> Some of these guys kind of come back to the same as what the mystic stuff. Hush. Okay, in the 18th century, the Christians began to apply some of the scientific stuff to Christian faith. There were radical theologians in England who said that uh, truth could be found by our, our rational inquiries. And so they did dogmas about nature of God and can you you pass it? Yeah, I'm looking to see. Yeah, I got it. Okay, thanks. So uh, they subjected beliefs about God and Christ to scientific they call this the period of the modern age of skepticism. Uh, and Armstrong goes that she says that these studies depend upon a literal understanding of scripture and ignore the symbolic or metaphorical nature of faith. Um, so what do you think a literal understanding of scripture was required uh, for these so-called, to, to perform these so-called scientific uh, studies, subject uh, these beliefs to scientific scrutiny? I mean, a literal understanding of scripture. I, I'm a little unsure of what, how she thought you had to look at this literally reading the scriptures. Did I don't remember. Did she give any examples of, you know, of one of these uh, scientific methods? Because to me, this sounds a lot like the beginning, which, which happened in the 18th century, the beginning of the Christian movement where they literally interpreted every word of the Bible to be true. Right. And so, and so, you know, if it's a question between what science demonstrates and what the Bible says, the Bible always wins. And so sometimes you have these sort of pseudoscience um, analysis of what's going on in the universe that supports your, your point your biblical point, but it's not really science. Is that what she's talking about? Or is she talking about 
true scientists that somehow we're, we're melding the two. I, I think she's talking about that point in history when any scientific investigation of uh, the unknown of God, et cetera, had to coincide with the scripture. Yeah, that was kind of what I was saying because the previous slide uh, talking about Newton sounded like the beginning of the intelligent design argument that we hear so much about, you know, today. Yeah, yeah Newton's argument does to me sound a lot, uh, it sounds very similar to intelligent design. Well, she did give some examples, you know, for example, um, I think one of them was um, Jesus feeding the 5,000. Well, rationally, how did that happen? Well, everybody was persuaded to bring their share, their lunch that they took to the gathering. Or maybe there was an example of Moses parting. I, she didn't give this one, but I've read this one before. Moses parting the Red Sea. Uh, the rational explanation was that there was a, a strong wind that parted the seas or something like that. You know, trying to find an explanation for everything that is rational um, is some of the part of people's trying to explain everything that occurs in there. It sounds like a miracle, but really it happened this way, which, oh, when you hear it that way, well, that makes sense. There yeah, was, I think they're trying to say that even the miracles happened within the natural scheme of things, that they followed yeah. natural laws. And, you know, even though we're talking about the 18th century here, you know, I remember sermons in the 1960s and 70s recounting some of the very same explanations, scientific explanations, mm -hmm. proposed explanations of, of miracles. Right. I think we still, in a sense, try to re reconcile our scientific knowledge with, uh, with scripture. Well, what do you think has happened with, when we take this literal approach to all scripture? Is there, uh, what, are, what do you think are some of the consequences of that approach, good or bad. What was your question, Dennis? Can you say? What are some of the consequences if you take a literal believe that everything in the Bible should be interpreted literally? Like the four corners of the earth? <laughs> well, that would be okay. You pick one. So you come up. Potentially, you could have the flat earth society uh, belief, or, that, or again, you would go into that the earth does not revolve around the sun, but that the sun, because you talk about the sun, you know, the sun passes over the sky. That's reading literally um, the scripture. Since the sun rises in the east, it sets in the west. Well, Obviously, the sun is not, uh, we're not orbiting the sun, it's the other way around. I mean, wouldn't that be a literal understanding of the scripture? Mm -hmm. I, I think one danger in that is you can literally spend all of your time arguing um, the validity of the Bible as, as literal truth. And then, you, you know, where, where do we spend our time uh, helping our neighbor? or feeding the sick, or uh, being with the person in prison, and all the other things that Jesus talked about. I, I, you know, I think you can get buried in the Bible and count yourself as, uh, as being a good Christian because you're out there trying to make these arguments, but you're not really doing what we've been commanded to do. That's kind of a concern I have personally, I guess. One, um, one thought I had about the literal understanding from what reading what Armstrong is saying is you lose some of the imagination about God. And she says, if God cannot appeal to your imagination, then God's in trouble. And it seems like if you have more of a symbolic metaphorical interpretation of some of these things, it, it can expand your imagination about God rather than the other way he kind of shrinks maybe. Well, I think we also spend an awful lot of time trying to rationalize uh, the differences, the inconsistencies between the Bible and your own personal experience and scientific knowledge. And I, again, that piggybacks on what Paul said, it's a, it's a waste of time. 
right. I, I agree with that. You can I think you can get yourself just twisted in knots trying to reconcile because of the literal approach. There's contradictions in the scriptures between the gospel of Matthew, for example, and the gospel of Luke about Jesus' birth. And you get into these arguments and trying to harmonize these things. And I just sometimes think you get yourself just twisted up. Anyway, that's, uh, that's. I do think, Dennis, I do think that there are some traditions that are teaching exactly that. They, they call themselves apologists. And everything that they learn is how to prove that the, the Bible is true and that, you know, you can, you, can, you can put Christianity up against any other religion and show why it's the true religion and it, it's, you know, literally truth. I actually listened to a young man for a while at a wedding last summer who was proving to my nephew why the earth is only whatever that number is 6,000 years old you know and even my nephew was a little embarrassed when I walked up because I'm looking at him going you've got to be kidding me this is what we're arguing about at a wedding you know so it's exactly what you guys are talking about they just spin and spin and spin the story to try to prove that they're right and science is wrong I guess okay thanks Okay, yeah. uh, Jerry? Yeah, I'm not thinking of specific examples at this moment, but to take the position that everything in the Bible is literally true, that's a very easy approach to, uh, it's so easy just to say, okay, it's literally true. I don't have to uh, compare and contrast and understand the background of circumstances to determine whether it is literally true on the one hand or whether it is something that is representative of a broader truth. Um, but it, in other words, it's it's an easy out, but it does not help reality. Yeah, just think about how much time we've spent studying the history of Christianity and the history of God and the Jewish view of certain aspects of the Bible. Yeah. I mean, it, it's enlightening. Uh, but it's work. Well, the, the thing that I think is interesting is that there are so many authors that that wrote the Bible and and are any of them perfect? Do they have a perfect exact account? No. I mean, none of us are. So how could it be exact? It's from your own perspective. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't have anything to say. I, I agree. So, um, this new religion, religion of reason, was known as deism. Um, this deity, these philosophers believe there was a person, or a, I shouldn't say a person. Uh, a deity, I'm just going to use deity, that uh, was led to the creation of the, of the reality we know, but he was impersonal. He, it, she, whatever, there's no real good way to describe that, uh, that they were impersonal, that they really weren't dealing with, you know, they didn't have personal, personal interactions with people that's the way they the deists look at um this this god but you i think that was kind of wasn't that kind of the clockmaker uh belief about god that he sort of just wound the clock wound the earth up and let it go and then backed off and doesn't interact with it yeah that's is, is that the same as yes is that the same as deism yeah they also call this, here I'll read a little bit, it says, the basic premise of deism is that while deists agree that the universe was created by a deity, this is not a personal God of the Orthodox religions who speaks to believers directly or be a revelation. It is a more distant and impersonal force that can only be un understood indirectly by the application of reason. 
This is uh, also known as natural theology. Uh, that was that it was, was wrong. wrong more more with Newton's idea of the uh, mechanic. I, I think it's compatible with that. Yeah. Uh, the, these philosophers of the Enlightenment didn't reject the idea of God. They just didn't like the God that they were finding in uh, religion of the Orthodox and the mysteries about him. There were some mysteries that they just, they didn't like mystery. Uh, uh, Newton was one in particular didn't didn't like mystery. Uh, I don't think uh, Descartes e either. Uh, Pascal, I think, is a little more... Uh, gray about that, but some of the doctrines, are these are doctrines that Christians hold, but they abhorred, so what do you think some of those might be, just for uh, just to name a few Hey, Dennis how, how what it, didn't Thomas Jefferson kind of like redo the Bible partly yes. because of this and I think one of the yes, things he, he, he took out all the miracles in the Bible Right, that's what I thought. He took out the miracles, so they abhorred miracles. I think he basically, he uh, he cut and pasted the New Testament. I don't know if he did anything with the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, he reduced that down to where uh, basically it was Jesus' teachings, uh, miracles, mm -hmm. things like that were removed. Because he, he was a deist, wasn't he? He and he and yes. John were deists. Yes, he was deist. <laughs> well, there's several of the uh, founders of of the Republic were deists. Besides, mm -hmm. besides Jefferson. <clears throat> there was another philosopher, uh, Voltaire. This is kind of interesting. I thought. He said that if God didn't didn't exist, it would have been necessary to invent him. What do you think he meant by that? Well, just as as uh, ancient pagan religions invented a multitude of gods, they were trying to explain uh, the world around them. Okay, and I think I think the same thing applies here. If if there really were no God, we would be inventing. Uh, one or more gods to explain why it rains, why the sun rises in the morning, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Somehow we got it. We, we need explanations for things. <laughs> so, yep, we do. and like, uh, like others, Voltaire's problem wasn't with God, but with doctrine that offended his idea, what he called his sacred standard of reason. Well, we've been talking about Christians. I'm going to move on to uh, a little bit about Jews, uh, Judaism, because they were also being affected by these new ideas and the secularization that was taking place in the West. Uh, even though they were kind of isolated from, uh, had you know, Christians were kind of had placed them in, you know, in uh, separated them and kind of restricted them from what they still were being affected by this. Um, one of these was Spinoza. Um, and he he was affected or influenced by Descartes and others. And he had these ideas that were different from conventional Judaism. And that led to his getting kicked out of the uh, synagogue in Amsterdam when he was about 24 years old. Um, I think today he's commonly thought of as a, an atheist, but he had a belief in God. It was just a, a really different belief in God. It wasn't the belief uh, of the God of the Torah. And this is more like, he sounds like a pantheist to me. He says, mm -hmm. God, right. all God was the sum of all eternal laws and existence, inherent and in, imminent in all things, material and spiritual. That sounds very pantheistic to me uh, does that strike that is that the way it strikes you he said that 
And this, I thought this was interesting. He said that reality cannot be divided into a part which is God and a part which is not God. If God cannot be separated from anything, then it is impossible to say that, quote, he, unquote, exists in any ordinary sense, which is what mystics have been saying all along. So how do you, do you think of God as separate from creation, part of creation, or something, something else, neither of those? Uh, this is kind of what the, all this is about, all these philosophers, what it, where is God in, fit into the things, scheme of things? So I'm my my feeling is he's part of all all creation, but okay, that's that's my bias, and that's based on years of singing hymns. Okay. Can you say that again, Jonathan? I mean, uh, my bias is that God is part of all of creation. Is part of all of creation. So he's he is he she it is. Part of all of that exists, and I again I blame that on my history of singing hymns. More of a pantheistic. Uh... Do you remember this is this is a, a little bit of a I don't know I'll, I'm just going to bring this up something I was thinking of back in the '60s. You remember there was a uh, Russian uh, cosmonauts went up and in, into space and it was reported they looked around and said, well, we didn't see God up there. Does anybody remember that? I do. I, I, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> well, is that sort of like thinking, well, this is this is how you can separate God is God is here because he's a separate thing. Is that uh, Oh, looking at it. There was another philosopher named Mendelssohn. Uh, he was German. He was also Jewish. He wrote some books from a German perspective, really didn't take into, not from really a Jewish viewpoint, but a German viewpoint. But he also said that um, this uh, religion of reason should re lead to respect of other ways of approaching God, which included Judaism, and that he was he's credited as opening the way for Jews to enter Western society. And that's all I uh, really had to say about him, but that was kind of an opening a door for Jews into uh, Western society. Um, and it wasn't really, Armstrong says it's the Jewish tenets are pretty much identical with the rational religion of enlightenment. So it wasn't that difficult for them to accept this German enlightenment philosophy. Um, Dennis, it, it took me a minute to kind of think about your question on God is separate from creation. I, I Can I answer it now? <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm sorry. I just, you know, I've never considered what I think about that. I, you know, I like what Jonathan said, and I know my own experiences to, um, many times to feel um, as, as if God is in the beauty of nature, the beauty of the world, and so forth. And yet, on a logical, um, a logical uh, way of looking at it, I guess, if God existed before anything was created, um, if that's a true statement, then God is not specifically a part of creation. God created creation, you know, creation. Um, so, so I have kind of this logical part of my brain that's thinking one thing and then the experiential part of my brain that's feeling something else. Um, so I'm a little bit torn on that one, I guess. Well, it seems like, can God be part of creation, but more than creation and exist without creation? Well, that's, well, that's what I'm saying. If, if that if that tenet of God is true, that God existed apart from creation, then by creating everything, did God become a part of it? That's, that's a theological question for you, I guess. 
Maybe you're going to be a philosopher after all. <laughs> yeah. Not a very good one. <laughs> Paul, you sound like a philosopher. My God. Ac yeah, an accidental philosopher, Nadine says. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with all this is we're influenced by the religion of logic and the religion of science. And I really firmly believe that those are, in fact, religions and biases that affect us. Okay. Just throwing that out. Well, we all come from a certain context in life. So if we've, we've grown up in, in the kind of swimming in this all our lives, so it seems it, it's part of us. Yeah. There was another philosopher, Kant, that was uh, more influential on the Jews than Mendelssohn. Um, He says he was one of the first ones to doubt the validity of the traditional proofs. He said they didn't prove anything. And that um, he argued that traditional arguments for the existence of God were useless because we could only understand things that exist in time or space. And we're not competent to consider realities that lie beyond this category. Are we competent to uh, consider other realities? Or we have to have just the physical world uh, that we see around us to understand stuff. What do you think about that? So whether you're a philosopher or not. Say that again, Jeremy. I said that depends on whether you're a philosopher or not. Okay. God was just a convenience for Kant, um, a way that allows us to function in the world, and he's not no longer the ground of all being. That was um, one of his beliefs. Um, there were, hey, at this, go ahead, Dan. How were the Jews influenced by Kant? I'm interested because my study of Kant was always led to Hegel and Marx and then Lenin. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the path that Kant led the, the people in Russia. But I, I wondered what his influence on the Jews was. Hmm. I don't know if I can answer that. All right. I have to look I'll, my I'll look it up. That's okay. Okay. Okay, I skipped one here. Where am I at now? Here we are. Um, at the time we have all this, this all this philosophers uh, using reason and ration and all this to uh, study God and develop ideas about who God is and there was also developing something called a, the religion of the heart. And it, it basically was that people should try to discover the God who was within your heart. And this was available, you know, anyone had this capability. Uh, this was kind of the born again experience. Um, now, I was wondering if this is what you were referring to. Uh, and an emotion, being born again, an emotional experience of religion was the only proof of genuine faith and hence of salvation. What do you think, Eloise? Well, was that I, one of your personal experiences or, I'll or something tell you else? What I run on to last night. I was going through a file, cleaning a file out, and I found a story of Johnny Bird. Oh, okay. That I had written for Restoration Witness, I think it was. Okay. So I sat there and read it, and here's the basic line. He was born not expected to live. Okay. 50 chance, nothing they could do for him. And they just told us that, you know. So when he was about eight, he lived. He had that thing that the Kennedy baby had. 
and um, but he overcame that part. His lungs did open. So okay. his pediatrician was an older fella, getting ready to retire. So when I, he was a harsh old fella, but he and I got along fine. Okay. I had four other kids and I just talked right back to him and we got along <laughs> great. So I took Johnny in for his 18 month checkup and the doctor uh, said, he started crying, tears going down his face. Now this harsh old man is crying. Uh -huh. And I didn't know what to say. And then he said, you know, I, this baby's fine. He's going to be fine. He said, I took this case to the pediatrician convention and explained that he was the only client that I'd ever had, only patient I'd ever had, that, w that had rigidity uh -huh. and lived. And they laughed at me. And they thought, oh, he's old. Oh. So he said, but it's the truth. He had rigidity and he lived. So he never said that to me. And 18 months later, he, he said it. But it was just a proof to me that there was something more there than just scientific, what can we do for this baby? There's something else mm -hmm. intervening there. And that was very real. And what had happened was the people, the women here at Prairie Village, canceled their speaker for a women's meeting. And they had a prayer service for Johnny. Okay. And me that night. And we both lived. And, you know, it just, it makes you a believer. You can't help it. You know, there's more there than we have control over. Okay. Did, did everyone hear that? Not entirely. <laughs> well, Ellie said that uh, her experience with the pediatrician uh, or hers and Donnie's experience of uh, his birth and what the pediatrician observed was that there was a 50-50 chance that he would live and then 18 months later uh, the pediatrician was said that he was going to be that he was fine, he was going to be okay, and Eloise. I guess this was that your when he was born that the prayer meeting was held. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and it was Thanksgiving. Today's his birthday. Okay, and this Johnny's this is Johnny's birthday, and that uh, when he was born, that uh, women in the congregation had a prayer meeting for them, and she says that. There's something beyond what the doctors what the doctors could do that enabled him to survive and flourish. And I mean, he actually became whole. I guess he was, his lungs were no longer rigid. Well, his whole body was. He called it rigidity. I Rigid. don't know what that says. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I thought you were referring to his lungs, but his whole no, body was. His whole body. Yeah. Okay. He called it rigidity. I think that means stiff. Yeah. So. And she said that when you have an experience like that, you, you really can't deny it. Not say, quite the same say as. Say that again, Dennis. When you have experience. Like when you have an experience that. I mean, I. We have an experience just like that. There's no denying that it happened to you. No denying. Right. Uh, that's not exactly a born again experience, but it was an experience with with God in a way that you really can't explain. Yeah. I guess is what. Um, but so I guess that would. What did that do for your faith then? Well, of course. You know, it makes you take note of everything around you more. You know, things happen happen all around us, and we don't pay that much attention always. 
but something like that makes you set up and take notice. Okay, so you become aware there's more than right. what you were aware of. Right. Um, so I, I that's that's Eloise's experience. Do you think there are other ways to uh, of knowing you have a genuine faith or it strengthens your faith? I mean, this born again experience is is fairly common, I guess, or is I don't know if that's a requirement in the evangelical uh, part of Christianity, but are there other ways besides that kind of an experience you think of knowing uh, you have a genuine faith? Are you, are you asking if we know if we have faith or somebody else does? Um, either. Well, I was, I was going to say, I was thinking, you know, some... I think some ministers would would be the ones to decide whether a parishioner has faith or not. And I don't I, I would never assume to sit in judgment of somebody else's faith. That's very personal. Um, I think, you know, instead of born again, we use the term transformation a lot now in community of Christ. And I feel like if somebody is living a transformed life, then the evidence of their faith is going to be present in in how they conduct themselves and how they treat other people and um, you know those kinds of things so i guess I, I don't know what each person's faith is but i can certainly see if somebody else is behaving like a good person or not Does that makes yeah. sense yes yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how you define genuine faith other than for yourself well i don't i agree i don't think i'm I guess I'm suspicious of somebody, and because you see this, like back in the uh, uh, medieval times of of people deciding somebody else is a heretic and and being put to death, that making a judgment on someone else's faith. I think you can, you know, it's I don't know how you can do that really, honestly. I, I'm not sure that faith is a constant. I, you know, we are bombarded with so much. There are experiences in my life that have caused me to have a great deal of faith in the, the goodness and blessings of God. There are other experiences that have made me doubt that. So I think that there's there we're bounced back and forth by life's experiences. Mm -hmm. And our faith grows or sh or shrinks depending on what's happening around us and what we what we focus on in life. So I'm I'm not sure. Anybody has the ability to judge somebody else's faith, um, and I'm not sure it's a constant. Okay, I thought of Mother Teresa. I think they found some of her writings that she had uh, lots of questions and doubts about things, but then you look at what she did, which is what Paul is arguing, and about her faith. So that might be an example. Okay. Um, well, Mother Teresa had a single ecstatic experience um kind of like pascal did i guess she had one moment in her young life um, that determined the course of what she was going to do as as a member of the order that that she joined and then you're right the rest of her life she was constantly questioning why am i not having more experiences like that if god is calling me to this and i'm doing this work and she never again had another experience that was of that intensity or that importance to her, but that one experience was what carried her through um, the rest of her. And she lived to be quite old, I think, when she finally passed away. She was in her 80s or 90s. Yes. Uh, there were some commonalities between the uh, religion of the heart and the rationalism of the Enlightenment, both uh, were anti establishment mistrusted external authority, hated uh, inhumanity, were enthusiastic about philanthropy. I'm not going to, I'm going to try to move on here. Um, this born again Christianity though led to religious fervor in the Great Awakening in the in New England in the 1730s. And then a century later, this religious fervor spread in New York and it was called the Burned Over District. You know your Mormon history. Um, so do you think this prepared uh, some Americans uh, or do you think this influenced Joseph Smith's own religious experience and the establishment of the Mormon movement? 
just uh, deviate onto our own past a little bit. Because he had, quite had, I don't know if you'd call it a born again experience, but it was quite an experience that he relates in, in the Grove. So, um, Another thing that I thought was interesting, she wrote that messianism was essential to the Great Awakening, and this was the belief that human effort would hasten the coming of God's kingdom and was attainable in the new world. This seems to me that this prepared some Americans to embrace uh, Joseph Smith's revelations to seek and seek to bring forth the cause of Zion. That seems very compatible to me, uh, that this was kind of preparatory uh, some of the what was going on in the larger Christian movement. Yeah, I, I do think Mormonism is is both a reaction in some sense against the Enlightenment and a return to the need for some kind of spiritual, personal experience, the, the burning fire kind of conversion. So I, I think Mormonism is a natural outgrowth of the time period. Uh, you know, every time there's a step forward, there's also resistance to it. And I think that, uh, in a sense, that uh, spiritual ecstasy is a is a reaction against the rational thought. Okay. And we see it. I think it, it continues even today. People on both sides of the spectrum, on both ends of the spectrum. Okay, that sums up pretty good. Um, back to the Jews, um, they were also headed. Uh, this religion started to develop this kind of a approach of religion of the heart. And there was a guy named uh, Eliezer, Israel Ben Eliezer. He became the leader of a movement called Hasidism. He wasn't a scholar. He wasn't privileged. He was very poor. About 36, he said that he was a faith healer and he, worked, he walked through the villages of Poland healing peasants and they began to call him Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov, or Best, was, I guess you call it a nickname. And he had a different approach. And he, he told the uh, Jews that it was, they had a duty to practice the dis discipline of concentration, Devika, and become aware of the all pervasive presence of God and experience the ecstatic joy of being aware of that presence. This brought them uh, the Jews' message of hope, spread, and Hasidism spread throughout the um, Jewish world, I guess you'd say. Uh, they believe that becoming aware of the godly spark, I've heard this phrase, I think, from some people here, within them, they would become more fully human. How does this, does this fit with your beliefs of having a godly spark, becoming more fully human if you uh, develop that spark, I guess you'd say? Is that compatible with uh, your belief? Don't we have a campfire song that starts off, it only takes a spark to get a fire going? Something like that? Something like that, yeah. And there's another one about this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think that really aligns with, with our, our beliefs a great deal. I think even in a, in a secular sense, people talk about, do you view the world as a glass half empty or half full? And I think it says something about attitude. Uh, and we encourage, I hope we encourage a positive attitude rather than a, uh, a deep despair over the, the sense of where the world is. Well, I, I mean, I think anybody can bring a message of hope. I think they're going to have somebody that's interested in hearing it, particularly in the Jewish circumstance of uh, the oppression that they had suffered persecution. Um, we're going to move on to running out of time here, but running on, uh, moving on to the Islamic world, just briefly, and I don't really, just want to mention that uh, a lot of scholars have really not paid much attention to the uh, Islam during the Enlightenment, but there was a guy named Muhammad Ibn Wahhab, al-Wahhab, that wanted to, kind of like other people, restore Islam to its original purity, and he was hostile to mysticism, he formed an alliance with a guy, Muhammad Ibn Saad, and I would emphasize the 
the Saad. He was a ruler of Central Arabia, and they did initiate some reforms and to attack oppression of the poor, immorality, and idolatry, and they became less mystic and more rational. Wahhabism, Wahhabism is now the dominant form of Sunni Islam in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, and some other places, Somalia, Palestine. So I just want to point out there, that's where uh, the Wahhabi uh, sect developed was during the Enlightenment. Then there, we've talked about atheism, how it was a form of uh, a nasty slur you called your enemies and um, people that other, they'd accuse somebody of being an atheist, even the person said they believed in God, but there was this guy, Dero, he, um, he proclaimed atheism, he got in prison, said he wasn't an atheist, but he said belief in God wasn't important which is the opposite of what God said, who, or Pascal said about God, who said it was uh, really, it was crucially important to believe in God if you wanted to have, uh, win the wager. Uh, some other things he said was that um, there's only nature and no God at all. Uh, there wasn't a need for a creator. This is kind of, whereas Newton thought of matter as being pass, passive, he said it had its own dynamic and its own laws. And that was what was responsible for the uh, creation we see. By the end of the uh, Age of Enlightenment, scientists and philosophers were declaring that, some philosophers anyway, were declaring that God was dead. Um, so I want to give you a little bit, but is there anything I didn't cover you found interesting you'd like to discuss? in the what time we have left. There was an interesting part in there about messianism in the Jewish world, but I didn't get into that. Um, had implications for Christianity and our uh, Again, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact as we study how the belief in God has evolved, that there are bits and pieces that we still, that form what we believe today. And uh, I, I think in, in a sense, we are all a little bit mystic, we're a little bit rational, uh, we're a little bit reformer, we're a little bit heretic. Uh -huh. And so I, I just find it fascinating to see kind of the genesis of some of those ideas through the, the study of the history of uh, God. Okay. Dennis. Eloise. A lady that lives over at Town Village, she's new, and but she's very forthcoming that she's an atheist. Okay. And she wants everyone in the dining room to know it. Mm -hmm. So every day, when she leaves, and they come in and eat early, so they're leaving while most of us are eating. She tells us something we need to know that day that helps her belief stay strong for her. And the last one was, there's a full moon tonight, pay attention. This strengthens my spiritual journey. She calls being an atheist a spiritual journey. See, everybody just looks at it in their own way uh -huh. and in a different way. You think but, you think atheism is a religion? She must. Okay. I mean, she calls, she says, uh, my spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they call atheism necessarily a religion, but I think a lot of people who are atheists consider themselves to be humanists. And there are humanists, um, I, I guess you call them ministers or priests or something like that, that officiate um, ceremonies and, and, you know, hold gatherings a lot like we do church, but they don't talk about God. They talk about uh, humanistic, you know, beliefs and, and how they approach the world. 
I uh, guess, have, have you heard of humanism? I, maybe not yeah. everybody's heard of that. Yeah. I was thinking, I guess I was trying to say, are people fervently atheists, kind of like some people are fervently religious? Uh, it's almost a religious approach they take. I mean, not to, if religion means belief in God, well, they're not religious, but if it, some people are so, I want to say in your face about what they believe sometimes that it's almost they're like passionate. They're very passionate. passionate. Maybe that's a better word. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's there. I mean, there is a skeptic society and I think a lot of those people are uh, passionate about what they think. <laughs> okay. I do think there's apologists on both sides. There, I have I have people in my life who who point out why you know religion and God just aren't going to work. You know they just don't work, and so they have their logical arguments. It's it's interesting. I kind of wonder about Armstrong because he makes some points, and I'm thinking, are you speaking about those people that in the history of God that she wrote, or is this some of this comes across to me sometimes as what? This is her belief, not necessarily some philosopher's belief. Does anybody else, does that kind of strike you sometimes about her, some of her statements in there? I, uh, I agree with that, definitely. Yeah, Paul, what did you call her last week? She she calls herself something. Um, I thought you kind of defined her, her belief system a little for us last week. I um, yeah, I don't remember what I said. I can't remember what I said 10 minutes ago. So <laughs> surprised. I, I think I think that she was a, a Buddhist. She she practices Buddhism. Um, I, I, back in the first chapter, she identified herself um, in a certain way. And I can't remember what she said. I'll go back and, and look it up here. I yeah, think she, she used probably, to be a nun, didn't she? she yeah, yes. She was, yes. She is an odd duck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she was the one that she was with. I mean, she actually did her Ph.D. dissertation and because she didn't pass the defense. She gave it up. And I thought, how many people would work for six or seven years to get that far and not redefend their <laughs> dissertation? <laughs> I know. That's crazy. Yeah. She's, I she has she's... written a ton of books. I was looking yeah. at all of her books. As Maybe. hard as it is to read them, I'm like, oh, well, that might be good. But. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, we need to wrap up here. Uh, next week, I believe it's Marilyn's turn to lead our discussion on chapter 10. This is the death of God. Question mark. Good, good luck, Marilyn. Hey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot for the for the choice. <laughs> we'll be recording everything you say. <laughs> I just want everybody to know that I did not pick this chapter. It was given to me. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been fate. It was the <laughs> yeah. it was the way the coin tossed. Yeah. <laughs>